Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Honeup Talks podcast this week. Uh, I have Kale Campbell, uh, the president of Red Seal Recruiting, a firm we've been working with in, in Canada uh, for the last, what, year or so, at least a year? Yeah, going uh, on two years now. Going on two years, yeah. Well, Kale's team is fantastic. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about Red Seal recruitment, their their operations in, in Canada. I guess first would love to hear, Kale, like how you stumbled into this this profession that is recruiting. Everybody has a funny, typically a good story or funny story on how it happened. What how did you start Red Seal? Sure. Um one one thing throughout my early career, and I, you know, I started working uh in in kind of the hardest industries. I worked commercial fishing, I worked diamond drilling, forest firefighting kind of work my way through college. And I always thought, you know, why am I working alongside this person? You know, what was their path to get here? And why are they still here? And why the hell am I still here? So, um, you know, that was always part of my mind. And then I got into uh, labor relations HR. So I was uh, first working for the government, helping resolve employment disputes when uh, employers were not following the contract or employees thought they were owed overtime. Uh, and then I went into private industry, um, several hundred person uh, business unit, um, resolving disputes, helping employees get back to the work if they're injured, and and hiring. And it, it was a pretty intense manufacturing environment, running twenty four seven. So people didn't have as enough sleep. I like to say when you you work shift work. So uh, a lot of passion uh, and and a lot of conflict. Um, I was able to resolve some of that conflict, but at the end of the day, uh, I I don't think my bucket was full. And and what I really enjoyed was helping a manager hire somebody good and seeing that employee uh, who we've helped hire doing well. Uh, You know, that was something that really filled my bucket. At the end of the day, I was like, oh, this is something I really enjoy. And uh, people always said I I was the person with a big smile walking around at work, and I felt I was losing that. So I left. I traveled a little bit around the world, South America, Central America. Took my mountain bike, and came back and and said, you know, what am I going to do? I'd always started small businesses when I was younger, and I'm like, where where did I have a big impact? I saw that, um, and and also. I saw the demographics uh, shifting right uh, in, into an aging workforce, and I, I had ran uh, databases on when people are going to retire and what supplemental labor was out there for for skilled labor. And I'm like, okay, you know, there, there there's demand here, and uh, yeah, I went down that road, and and here we are, almost 20 years later, 19 years later, and uh, managed to feed my dog and now two kids. And, and, you know, there's, I think it comes from total recall. We got 16 kids to feed, you know, we got a team of 14 and there's so many kids that our team is uh, really supporting directly uh, and then helping out people indirectly, you know, get raises, get better jobs and stuff. So pretty, pretty happy with, you know, what we've been able to help even people who've, you know, were out with my team for two or five years and have moved on. Um, you know, I still, see see their kids either at our school or on Facebook and stuff. So pretty happy with the journey. Uh, you know, sometimes it's not about, you know, becoming a millionaire. Sometimes it's about the journey. So helping families and, and seeing them grow. And after 19 years, you're, you're seeing these other families grow too, which is, is fantastic. Yeah. I love your, your point about uh, kind of seeing that new hire succeed and like grow with the company. I remember I, I, when I started with an external recruitment, um, you don't see that as much outside and and because you, you place someone or you, you have that initial conversation with them, you get them on the door and then they, you know, then they excel and grow within the organization and you're you're not internal. So you don't really see that. But when I went in-house, you know, that was definitely a shift where, you know, you source a candy, you get them excited, you, you hire them, you convince them to work there. And then, you, you know, ho- hopefully you were honest because they're going to be seeing you in the hallway and they're going to know if what you told them on that phone screen and the pitch about how amazing it is to work there is true or not. Right. And so, yeah. you know, there is this validation and and you know getting to getting to see the people that you're recruiting versus just kind of a one-time placement so well and there's that quality measure right where i'm always like okay you know how long have our placements been there uh what kind of an impact have they had right and and that's something internal gets to do more often 
but we, I see it as well. Like there's, there's people I've placed and people I haven't placed and seen their promotions. And I'm like, God, my client missed out on that guy because you're like, I a, knew it. I knew it. I knew he's it. A, he's a director. He's a director now. And it, I, I often say, I'll, I'll say it on LinkedIn. Whenever I see somebody get a promotion, I'm like, Oh, director next, or, you know, VP of HR, VP, you know, um, People move up and you get to see that now on LinkedIn when we, we started our careers, uh, you know, like there were still faxes coming in and stuff, right? Um, Hard to track so it. Yeah, difficult. Technology has changed and, you know, definitely uh, you guys play a part in that and and all of our systems have changed, but it's still nice to see where people go. That's true. Yeah. The career journeys. Um, Kale, I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more about your specific focus there at Red Seal. And I think it's interesting. One, also due to the geography, right? You're in... Victoria, British Columbia, which is, you know, I thought I was in the Northwest right now in, in Spokane, Washington. You're in the very Northwest. You're like, you're even further. So um, just curious to kind of, does that impact business? Are you able to work on roles anywhere? Um, does your, I think your team spread out through BC, British Columbia and and other parts of Canada. Well, we're, we're, we're national. Um, okay. So you're national. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one of, one of our best hires was somebody in Florida, uh, driving West one time. Right. Okay. Um, I, I like to say, I don't care where people live as long as they're passionate and they, they want to work hard. And we got people in Ontario, um, Saskatchewan and Alberta and British Columbia, And the nice thing about starting our day on the West Coast is when people are finished their workday, we can catch them, right? So we can catch them before they have dinner or we can catch them after they have dinner uh, because it's three hours difference between the West Coast and the East Coast. So that's a nice little advantage. That's a great point. You got that five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock Eastern phone screen time. Yeah, because like we... We we really measure our our outreaches and when we're asking people is there a good time and usually it's like when they're done work right like we're we're heading hunting people who are employed so it's when they're done work and if, if I'm like oh I got to run home and you know pick up the kids and stuff that's important to me so I'll do it uh, but for a lot of our t- team right if they're at four o'clock here Pacific you know that's seven o'clock Eastern so they'll hopefully grab somebody on their way home from work during their commute or or just after yeah, they're that's done work. Great. Great point. I, yeah, I, I guess I've worked in the East Coast and the West Coast. You're right. There is something about um, the rest kind of catching up to the rest of the world versus being the first one up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you can catch catch somebody at their desk if you get up super early. My kids get up between four and four and six thirty. Right. So, um, you know, you can still catch people um, if if you want to on, on the East Coast at earlier times. So so I know you're based in Canada, but you now you service clients in Canada and also the United States. Prim- is that right? Primarily those- for sure. Yeah, yeah. Primarily service out out of our our C- Seattle office, which you know we only use when we go down uh, there. Uh, but we've got some good clients down on the on the West Coast, um, and and then we've also serviced people in New York and Florida and places like that. Um, it- what are you seeing from like a, from a? I guess I'm curious about not only geography, but just the the sector that you're in, in terms of energy, which is oil and gas and, you know, wind and all solar and all these things are converging and changing. How, what, how are you gauging? What are you seeing in terms of the types of wrecks you're working on? Has that shifted? Do you see a difference between Canadian roles versus U.S. roles, maybe from a geopolitical type of standpoint? Just curious on what. Yeah, you're it's doing. it's interesting. And, and I'm really kind of tuned into the North American Free Trade Agreement, which has been repackaged as uh, uh, CUSMA, um, you know, a new acronym. But but really, there is a ton of movement between Canada and United States. You know, not not as much as you'd see between states that are beside each other, like California and uh, Oregon. You know, there's a lot of move, movement that way. But North and South, there's quite a bit of movement, and especially in sectors that really drive things, you know, whether it's energy sector or not. Um, so we see um, the power grid, for example, is, is super important. Uh, you know, we've seen challenges in different states uh, due to weather and um, climate change. So the people who actually work on that power grid can come from Canada and move north and south. So we're definitely seeing that impact, uh, s- supply and demand, and and then also commodity price shifts. Right. So at this in 2020, people weren't driving very much. Right to the C word we don't even want to bring up sometimes, uh, but they they weren't driving as much. So fuel prices declined. There was a 
a acute restriction in, in in trade, so there wasn't as much shipping happen. So fuel prices dropped, um, and 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 the commodity dropped. So there was layoffs, right? Mm -hmm. And now that that's rebounded, fuel prices. I mean, we see it at the pump, but it also usually results in more money for those energy companies. So they're competing for talent that they had might have laid off, and that. Okay that that talent might have gone and worked in trucking or it might have gone and worked in a mining or logistics or aviation so things have shifted and almost all sectors are are, are hitting on all cylinders so people are not not able to name their prices as, as much as some people in the tech sector had you know three six months ago uh, but really the, the the salaries are increasing and you know, people, if, they, if they're offering the same old, same old, are just not getting it. So you've got to either be bang on on, on salary, uh, you know, kind of leading the pack, or you got to have flexibility. I, I saw a, a guy, he he works in in mining, I believe, or or transportation. And he said, the shift I wanted was three 12-hour shifts. So he's okay. working 36 hours a week. And I I almost bet he just negotiated that. I see job ads that say you work the shift you want and you'll get the income you want based on the amount you want to work, right? So anywhere between 150,000 and 250,000 um, and it's partly how much you want to work, right? And are you seeing that on both like full-time permanent roles as well as contract roles that might be three months stints, six months stints, people are able to kind of pick their schedules or negotiate their rates? Those, th those are our are, are perm, right? I, I'm seeing so, clients yeah. that have had the same you know, nine to five or um, four 12 hour shifts for, you know, like as, as long as we've owned our company or as long as, as, as a business or a manufacturing operation or mining operation has been happening. And now they're getting flexible because they're like, you know, what can we do? And we That's can't great rate. to hear. That's great to yeah. hear. We typically think about the kind of the future of work and the flexible shift and schedules for, for professional roles that used to be in an office. Now they're at home or hybrid, or there's some flexibility shifting, or people are doing that four day versus five day work week. Very interesting to hear that the skilled trades are also making an adjustment. Instead of four by ten, it's three by twelve, right? And you know, just even shaving off that other day is like yeah, is and, a huge and, and we 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 need to get our time back, right? And I, I think yeah. management has seen that, so everybody has seen that. That okay. You know, I was able to work from home, right? Business still happened. Uh, you know, people went out of their way and covered things and 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 we made adjustments and and really they're saying, oh well, we got to challenge that paradigm that um, you know, a nurse has to work X, right? Because if if that doesn't fit our lifestyle and we need somebody in here sa saving patients, you know, I'm not in healthcare, but we need somebody in here saving patients, let's make an adjustment for her. That's great. I just, I hadn't, I hadn't, I don't work on in kind of the skilled side of things. So that's just fascinating. I hadn't heard about that shift, but that seems like yeah. a very positive thing and maybe more flexibility. And that's, that's also going to evenly distribute or, or, you know, if you have less, more people maybe working a little less hours, it also might help companies absorb, you know, when people leave and things like that, it might distribute that a little more across more people. So yeah, and if 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 you show flexibility, like a, a client shows flexibility, I mean, I, I see it on 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 LinkedIn. I, I see one of my team just like a picture with her and her two kids, uh, and she's just like I'm so thankful I have this flexibility. I'm like, oh, I don't I don't want you to have to be working if you've got two kids, but like they've they've got that option to go pick them up or make those changes. And yeah. um, you know, we've always had flexibility internally, but I, I think. For us and a lot of employers, we 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 now said, yeah, we got to be really flexible. So, in terms of Red Seal recruiting, like in your business operations, are you do you have separate teams? One one team account managers maybe going hunting new business and development and finding new clients, and another side of the business that are operational and filling roles or finding candidates. Do you have or do does one person manage both sides of the desk? How do you, how do you structure your team? Has it shifted over time? What 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 have you learned? Yeah, so we're we're trying to stick with a a, a split desk, but more of a, more of a team, right? So um, one thing in interviewing recruiters over the years, you know, um, I'll, I'll I'll talk to a lot of senior recruiters, and they're like, "Oh, we we didn't do well because I didn't have good recruiters." I'm like, "Well, it's a partnership, right? Like, I I, I want that that team." both servicing that customer. So a very team servicing that customer, hearing what they need 
and and really building together uh, to find the right people. So um, it is tough to keep you know those senior recruiters who've been hunters in the past uh, not you know, doing those searches and and getting back on the phone all the time with the, the past candidates kind of working their network. Uh, but it, it really helps that they've, they can mentor uh, the recruiter, they can touch base, they can provide that f- feedback. And, and when one of them's sick, they'll jump in for each other. So yeah. definitely that, that split desk where one person is candidate facing, and one is employer facing. But you know, when we're launching a search, you know, we try and get them both together to kind of hear and be able to probe together. And when there's a quality check, hey, I don't know if this candidate is perfect. Um, you know, we can shoot them a hone it over and we we can listen to it and be like, yeah, that, that person sounds really good. Or I think you got to go back to them and probe a little bit deeper here. Right. So I, I think quality improves and uh, results, you know, are, are coming. Uh, but it it also means you got to train twice as many people. People love the, in recruitment, the rainmaker who could do everything. And, you know, we, we all believe in our, in our own minds, if we've been successful at one point that, you know, we, we can figure out what an employer needs and go out and find them. But that shift takes energy. And if you can be figuring out what the employer needs, satisfying them, making sure that your team is capable of care of them, you can do that again with the next client and, and really kind of be focused on kind of growing that where the candidate candidate focused recruiter can be really networking, taking that following up and, and not having to switch hats. Yeah. And it's just, there, there's different motivations. There's different, just having a specific focus. Yeah. Especially as a business leader, like you're, you know what I mean? You know, having people that aren't distracted or torn one side or the other throughout the day, you know, that's our, there's already enough distractions. I, I think whenever you can focus, it's probably better. Um, yeah. So um, has that helped? Has, you know, we talk a lot about like the number of conversations it takes to get someone hired. And, and many times recruiting firms, there could be multiple conversations with a candidate within a firm, right? I, I came from a world where I would talk to a candidate. My boss would want to talk to him. The account manager would want to talk to him because there was trust issues or transparency issues, just some of that within the firm. And then when you present a candidate, obviously there's trust issues and, you know, motivations, you know, financial motivations from the corporate recruiter versus the external recruiting organization. And then there's just challenges between recruiters and hiring managers generally and hiring teams generally where there's, you know, misinterpretation, miscommunication that can happen each step of the way. So fun to hear that you see that maybe the Honet highlights or the the interview clips have helped in your team you know, one person can take the call, another one person or even yourself can review a few highlights. And now you can all collaborate on and hear talent from a single phone screen, maybe versus two or three separate conversations at the agency. Are you seeing gains there? Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, one of our core, core values is teamwork, right? And when you, when you get a good candidate, uh, you're like, oh, I really want to place this person. I want to kind of own this. But also, if you don't have all the connections, a real a team can really help that person and help all of your clients. So it's easy to share that conversation and it not get lost in translation and not have to, you know, find find the written word and like kind of parse that and oh I, I don't understand what the recruiter wrote and stuff, right? So we could just tag everybody uh and say, you know, I didn't place this person. They're really great. Here are the top three highlights. And that can draw in the other team members to be like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to listen to that person. And, you know, them much better than you would just with a resume. Right. So you you can take that 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. You're like, OK, but you don't have to reschedule it. Uh, we, we had a candidate. Um, I think we screened in 2019, 2020. And I, I forwarded the pre-screen to the team member uh, who was interested in placing this person. And, it, you know, it's an old written thing, right? Uh, so being able to share anything helps, but able to share the voice helps. And it really shows in our um, our submission to interview ratio, right? Mm-hmm. So when we submit a client, uh, a, a candidate's resume and hone it recording, um, we we measure how many interviews we get as a result of that. And it basically doubled it, right? We were at kind of a 20, 21.66%. Uh, uh, so about, you know, less, less than a quarter uh, of our submissions were getting interviews. Okay. And, you know, it, it's affected by the quality of the, um, 
you know, the recruiter and the ability to follow up and stuff. So we have made changes over this time, but it went from 21.66 to 53.87, right? So Wow. So for every two people you submitted, one of them was getting an interview on site or with the client. Yeah. Yeah. O- o- over half of them, right? So, um, you know, other things might have changed as well, but but really that's that's a huge increase in, uh, like, if, if you think of sales, right? If you, if you can you can get twice as many sales meeting or twice as many presentations, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's really good. Right. It's so a fun, it's a funnel. So if you can, if you can two X any step of your funnel, <laughs> that's, that's a real order of magnitude shift, but that that's maybe one of the most important steps is what that client facing candidate presentation consists of. And how are you conveying one, you did your job two you earned your fee and three, you're showing your work. To this yeah. client who's going to be paying you, right? So, um, I think there's there's opportunities. We're always thinking about how do we improve all these different steps of the funnel. How do we how do we attract candidates to even get them to bite and respond to us? How do we get them on the phone faster? How do we screen them better, right? And then how do we submit them faster? I love that you've seen what almost a two x gain at that for sure. And screen to submit. Wait, submittal to interview. Ratio. ratio. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that makes such a big difference, right? Cause you, you got to think of how much time it takes, right? Like, you know, like we, we've got, you know, we're doing thousands, thousands of pre-screens, right? And uh, some of them we're not going to submit, right? Like, we're like, oh, that's a great person, but not for this client, right? You know, they, the location didn't fit or their attitude, their core values don't, don't fit, right? So um, we're not going to submit them. Right. Like, and we're not going to change their words and like try and so, um, you know, we, we, we can't change, you know, the, the number that we'll submit. Right. But we, though, that's take change hasn't changed at all. Like it's, it's actually gone down 1%. Uh, but that's, that's, that's pretty small. But it, if you can think of all that work, you know, and the recruiter is getting frustrated. Oh, the client doesn't care. Keep They're declining not declining my candidates. They keep declining my candidates. They keep declining yeah. my candidates. Like that. So is- they, they get. No. They get twice that feedback loop in, increase, and and also what we in in watching those ratios, we're like, okay, so what what else needs to improve? And it's our interview to placement. So, um, you know, we're yeah. we're 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 going to be working harder uh, this quarter on prepping our candidates for interviews. Right. So you've got the interview, that's great. So let's talk about how you answer. You know, these three questions. You know, what what questions are you going to bring to the organization? Like. Um, you know, that'll add value and help you get you over that that step, right? And what are you going to be wearing? Like, so really kind of, we we used to just send them a PDF, but, you know, if we can help that ratio, um, that'll help our uh, bottom line, right? Which which right now is, is super important. Have you thought about uh, creating a call guide in Honit and doing that prep call in Honit and having a structured kind of... Uh, it's not script, but a guide to to walk someone through a fifteen minute prep call the day before, or oh, you they- know that's that's a great idea because then you can also send it to them. Uh, you know, not everybody's ready for for the the feedback, but they can be like, oh yeah, I I sound a little needy when I answer that question. You know, maybe yeah, maybe I'll I'll, I'll change that. So yeah, because yeah, you know we can give feedback and say that's good, but you can be like, oh well, here here's that you can use that, and if you want to try practicing those questions, you know, with your 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 wife or your your husband or daughter, you know, go ahead. The other t- tip I'd share that we've seen some other firms do is, um, you know, your first candidate that you submit that interviews, you know, you're going to want to have that debrief call with them afterwards. So click the Chrome extension, call out to the candidate. Hey, how did the interview go today? What did they talk about? What did they? So you're gathering insights on what was discussed, what questions were asked, and now companies can use that intel to communicate that to the sourcers or recruiters to prep the, you know, to the call we just talked about. And and to go after better candidates that are better suited for those questions that which we might not have uh, uh, discovered when we kicked off the search with the employer. They might've been like, oh, you know, that's not so important. And you're like, it has three questions on this, right? You know, so that that we need as much feedback happening, but we also have to kind of manage that and, and say, you know, like how big was the retainer and, you know, how, you know, what are the chances we're going to make this fill, right? Um, so yeah, that's because like, it, it's it, like it, going it, to a test and there's three questions on the test that weren't in the book or that the teacher didn't talk about during lecture. And you're like, wait, what? Like that. But if, you know, 
I feel like a, a, a search and a wreck, it's like this evolving thing. The job description is just one moment in time, right? Yeah. The intake call with a hiring manager is just a moment in time on what they think they want or need at that moment. Well, things change, you know, people leave, you know, new teams are formed, new business gets created. Like that roller wreck is shifting throughout the entire interview process. Yeah. To your point, what's even discussed on the on-site interviews might be different than what they had in mind previously. So all of that intelligence, all of that recruiting intelligence uh, can be used. And that's, we're, we're really excited to think that, you know, each of these conversations we have as a recruiter, the intake call, the phone screens, the debriefs, the prep calls, the reference calls, all of those calls contain talent insights and recruiting insights. And it's just a matter of organizing it, maybe structurizing it and being able to find it again when you need it to use when you need it. So for sure. I, yeah. I that. Yeah. And yeah. and we, we've got to think about using technology for all of it, for our reference checks for uh, contingent search, um, you know, in, in talking to leaders and managers, they're like, I don't have time to do references and, and like get on the phone, make this appointment, click this Calendly link. So what we do is we offer that, right? But we also say, click on this link and you can fill these out, right? Uh, and the nice thing is, is like you're getting, you know, you're getting their corporate email address, you're verifying who they are and you're putting them on the record rather than, you know, sometimes people can be like, oh, Maybe I said that. I can't remember what I said about that employee, but um, it's it's actually quicker to get um, reference checks done if you give them options, right? Yeah. Uh, because hey, we can do a five minute call, or here's a link to answer a couple quick questions. And, and you can do it do it on your mobile phone. And if I say if I if we see something there, recruiters see something there, we can follow back up, right? So yeah, we got to think of all ways that we can you know get use technology and make things more efficient because. Really, time time definitely does matter for our clients and and for for closing candidates as well. Now, when you talk to a great candidate that you may not have a roller rec for at the moment, has your team created a, a share link in Honet where you hide the name, hide the resume, hide the picture, and use that link to market that candidate proactively to other companies that might need that skill set in terms of business development, candidate marketing, MPC type stuff? Have yeah. You so we haven't done a uh, hone it MPC. Uh, you know, that's definitely something we can focus on a little bit more and, and try out. Uh, the nice thing is within our ATS, we can A-B test things, right? So, you know, what is, is converting? Um, I'm thinking about doing a Friday MPC list of, you know, uh, so, so we, we, we can see if okay. they'll, they'll click on that. Right. And you know, what, what are the open rates? Right. So, cause yeah, if somebody has a little bit of interest, but it's like, Oh, I don't want to talk to this freaking recruiter or, or, you know, I'm sure everybody wants to talk to me on a Friday, but um, right. they, they could be like, Oh, I, you know, and they hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So I, it, it's a good idea. Well, we, yeah, we can show, I'm happy to show you how you do it. Even if you have a project or you have a couple of candidates, just select the two or three candidates that are available, active, awesome. Maybe they have share a similar uh, role or responsibility. So you could kind of bundle them. Hey, here are three line production workers or here are three superintendents or whatever the thing is. But you can put three candidates on a link, hide their PII, and now just have a link that's tracked. And, and if you're measuring it in your, your ATS, even better. We, we track the links, but you can also track them in your CRM. So yeah. um, good. Cool. Um, Kel, I wanted to talk a little bit about the the network that you've put together. Um, I know I know you there, you're involved with a, there's kind of a recruiter network that you're involved with, but there's also you're very involved with Ukraine and what's happening there. I guess we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Share that with our audience here. If anybody is interested, they can reach out to try to help um, the cause. Yeah, for sure. Um... I've I've always done a little bit of international. Maybe ten percent of our hiring has you know been through the free trade agreements or um, any, any number of immigration uh, avenues that are available in the U.S. or Canada. And I, I'd spoken to Ukrainians before and and never had a chance to visit. Uh, but when war uh, really broke out or escalated, um, there's been conflict going on since 2015. And I've had a lot of Ukrainians correct me by saying it's not a conflict now, it's a war, Kale. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I've spoken to, you know, somebody who had a, a six-month-old baby and she's like, Kale, I never thought 
I'd have to leave my home. And and she was living on a cruise ship. Her husband was a captain of a cruise ship. And, you know, they, they basically had to evacuate. And one of the things that a lot of countries have done is, is allow work permits, uh, you know, multiple multi-year work permits and, and really try to help find a, a place for displaced Ukrainians. And Canada has welcomed, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, tens of thousands, and we're on track to welcome hundreds of thousands. And, wow. and we've got millions of job openings, right? So really, you know, that's a huge help to us and, and to them, right? They, they can be in a safe place, they can earn some income, possibly sending some of it home, or if they've been able to bring their whole family, there's lots of people who want to bring their parents. Um, yeah, so I started a Canadian Jobs for Ukrainians uh, Facebook group. It's grown to 36,000 people. Uh, it, it it started to consume so much time. Uh, you know, at, at one point I said, I, I've really got to step, step back, concentrate on my business, and my family. Uh, but I, I'm currently administering that group. And it's really great to kind of see what employers are doing. Um, you know, one one employer, Toyota, is offering interviews in in six languages, including Ukrainian. Fantastic! Wow. Right. So, 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 kind of seeing uh, what them what flex employers... there, them they're, they're flexing their processes to help like that. When does that happen with big? You know, even small to mid sized companies, change is hard. But the, here you see a very big institution shifting their interview and hiring process to, you know. Uh, you know, include be more inclusive right to, yeah to, yeah well and 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 i i see media reports of employers who who can't hire right and i'm like well, what have you done how is it a priority and what what have, have you changed right and um you know we we got to think most of the world doesn't even speak english right so uh and in this case you know how important it is to be flexible when helping people who are escaping war i mean that to me, is one of the most important things we can do uh, as employers and, and and as a country, right? So, um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a great avenue. Um, there's definitely some challenges with um, not, uh, you know, single men can't leave Ukraine because uh, they're they're basically being constricted to support in the war effort. But uh, definitely, those with families and a lot of uh, really outstanding women who, you know, often have multiple degrees have been like experts in Western Europe or experts in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and like, just, so, I've been amazed at the talent, uh, global talent, because a lot of Ukrainians had already been working outside of Ukraine. Right. Uh, right. And, it, was and tech said, it was a big tech hub. I remember uh, some technology, a tech, uh, two mogul I worked with in, in the Bay Area. We had a, a big engineering shop in Ukraine and like the DevOps team was there. And yeah, it was a big, and I think, you know, very highly skilled and highly technical and smart individuals. So yeah, you would think there'd be a, a, a how is the knowledge gap? How is that? Uh, how, how, are, how is that happening in terms of introducing or yeah, connections? is it definitely, I mean, there, there's a, um, an accountant with a US MBA, right. Who'd already been working for us companies. Right. So we had competing job offers, my client, uh, also one of my friends and, uh, you know, another, another job offer. Right. So it, it's good to see the competition and we lost, but you know what? She got a job. Her mom was coming, you know, like it, it, it's a great gift to be able to get somebody, but also to, to help them. And, you know, we're going to stay in touch and I might place her in two to three years. Who knows? There you go. Yeah. No, stay in touch. Yeah. And, and, conversation. Yeah. and definitely on, on the gap, like if we look at, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have access to translation, right? So there, there, there's excellent translation services out there. I have a friend who runs a company, uh, but if you're stuck in the moment of like, can I hire this person? They can be sitting there with their Google translate open and, help get through any questions and the ability to share pictures everybody's traveling around you know doing their work and able to take pictures and videos and i'm just like you know take a video and and that has really helped on on the gap as well right because we had ukrainians working in russia they were feeling a lot of um anti-ukrainian sentiment and they're like kale I, I gotta get out of here 
And they were able to share videos of, of their work and how they, their processes. And yeah, so between Google Translate, uh, Facebook is automatically translating some languages, not both ways and stuff, but, um, you're, you're like chatting with somebody and you're like, Hey, your English is really good. And they're like, Kale, I'm using the translate. And I'm like, Oh, I'm having to translate what you're doing. So not everything is perfect, but you got to think the communication gaps that we saw 10, 15 years ago, uh, yeah, they're, they're just changing, right? Um, you know, I haven't had a chance to put a, a hone it through any translation tools, but if we're asking we a talk question... about that, though, we could talk about that. We do now transcribe in 24 languages, but um, I think the translation piece is also interesting. You have the call in English or you ask a question in English and you say, hey, answer in your native language. And you can capture that soundbite in, in the native language, transcribe it in the native language, then translate it to the hiring manager's language, right? Or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and definitely one thing I, I, I saw is that things get lost in translation, right? So um, a, a woman's like, uh, yeah, I'm looking for something maybe related to construction. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Like, tell me what you did. Like, she's like, oh, maybe something in cleaning or and tell me what you did. She was the materials engineering manager on the largest residential construction project in Russia. 4,000 units she, she was building. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm like, oh, you're, you're, you're not getting a cleaning job. You're getting, because uh, like, we're, we're, we're like a lot of other uh, cities uh, and, and the United States, I think, I think we're, we're looking at lots of construction needs as immigration uh, happens and people move, move to cities and stuff. And I'm like, we, we need you to be doing. That's an engineering role in you know, cleaning facility, construction, or, you know, whatever. Well, well and, and, and she, yeah, so she, she got a, a, a project management engineering role, and she's able to bring in practices from Ukraine, from Russia, and really help speed development, because we, we don't do a lot of, uh, you know, 4,000 person residential developments. Like, I mean, you got to think, yeah, she was building blocks, like city blocks of residential. Uh, so, you know, like I, I, I think there are places where, you know, they'll do a block, but in, in our cities, like there, there's nowhere to really expand that fast. Uh, but we need to, right. Like we're, we're shifting and we're going to have to build <laughs> thousands of unit. So um, yeah, but, but definitely one of the things that got lost in translation is she wasn't able to say exactly what she did, but I'm like, show me the photos. I'm like, oh, you're you're involved in building that. I'm like, what are you? How are you doing that, right? And between Google Translate and photos and stuff, I I could piece it together. Um, I didn't charge any money, but I placed her with a a, a company, and she's doing really well. And you know, there there's lots of times where it's like, oh man, you know, if this person had perfect English, I'd be making a placement here. But I'm like. I know yeah. the cl client is is not willing to pay, you know, one hundred thirty thousand for this this role. So they're going to be underpaying because the person has this this knowledge and language gap. I'm like, pay them as much as you can because it's this is an expensive city. And you know what? In three to five years, I'll, I'll place this person again. Right? Like, stay in you touch. Know, yeah, like stay in touch. You know, I've I've done a, a solid for the company and and the individual. And like the last thing I want to do is have our fees get in the way of somebody who needs to escape and needs a job, right? Like that's I, well, that you're doing yeah. great stuff, you know, Kale. I, I I always joke that we're the recruiting profession, we've mm -hmm. always kind of been expected to be translators in a way where we're talking to someone who knows a lot about a thing. Let's call them a QA engineer. Uh, and then we're also talking to a QA director, a hiring manager. Those two speak that language of QA or finance or accounting or medical you know, jargon, right? But we don't, we're the middle person trying to be that interpreter. But in this case, throwing that additional language translation just is another order of magnitude of, of, of matchmaker, right? Which is why the human element still matters, why we think these conversations are still essential to the recruiting and hiring process. So yeah. And, and the, like one of the things we've talked about in the past, you and I is, you know, the, the canned video you can't probe in a canned video. You can't say, tell me a little bit more. Is, you know, I, I don't quite get that. Can you write me an email on that? And, or can you send me a picture, right? Because sometimes words fail us. And you, that human element, like you said, is, is so important, right? Well, 
you're doing great stuff. Keep it up. And hopefully you've learned some tips and tricks to manage that, that Facebook group. Now that it's 37,000 people, that, that probably gets to be a bit uh, tricky in terms of, yeah, you're right. You might need to hire someone or organize a volunteer. Well, uh, that, three, that, that's, three, three by 10 hour shifts or something like that. Three by 10 hours. Well, the nice thing about community uh, is, is that, you know, people uh, have come out of the woodwork. There's so many Ukrainians in the United States. There's so many Ukrainians in Canada that, uh, you know, people have really stepped up and not, not like just donated to the food bank or, you know, done, done one thing. They put in the hours and, and that, that's, that's amazing to see because uh, conflict doesn't go away. Unfortunately, uh, you know, there's no end in sight, but also the volunteers and people with their U- Ukrainian heritage and people who don't, you know, people who immigrated on their own uh, are really stepping up. So it's, 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 it's been great to see. Well, you're doing your part. Well, Kale, thanks so much for the the fun conversation today. I know we talked about a lot, but again, it's been a pleasure working with you and your team. Amazing recruiting organization. Um, I love that you're in the Pacific Northwest as well. And I feel like we're neighbors in a way. Victoria, uh, beautiful, went there last summer with the in-laws and first time to Victoria, but it was an, it was an amazing trip. Um, yeah. But we're here if you need anything, Kale. And again, thank you for the time today. Really appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank okay. you so much, Nick. Take care. Thanks, Kale.